Quail here. Today we're going to be talking about the Wrath and Glory character creation process. So before we begin, we need to discuss one thing. There are actually two different versions of Wrath and Glory. One was made by Ulysses, which was the original version, but there's been an updated version released by Cubicle 7. We'll be discussing the Cubicle 7 version of the rules as that is the most up-to-date version and is the most comprehensive. So to start off, we're going to quickly go over how the basic rules work for uh, Wrath and Glory. It is a dice pool system that combines your attributes and your skill ratings together and you roll that many dice. So if you have, let's say, a strength of 2, an athletics of 3, together that would make 5 dice. Now, out of those five dice, one of those would be a Wrath die. You roll those together, and then you see if you have any successes. Successes are four, fives, and sixes. Sixes, however, count as two successes. So out of those dice, if I roll one, two, one, three, then a four, five, and a six, that means I would have a total of four successes, because there's one four, which counts as one, one five that counts as one, and then one six, which counts as two. So, if I roll those five dice, and I get a two, a three, and then two fives and a six, that means I would have four successes. That's because the fives each count as one, and the six counts as two. I will be going over the rules in more in depth in a later video, but for now that should at least give you enough of an idea on how to allocate your points and your XP in Wrath and Glory. So first things first, we're going to go over the character sheet. On the top is the information for your character. Uh, the character's name, player name, something called framework and keywords. Okay. So on the top of the page, you'll have uh, all the character information, such as the player name, and the character name, what race they are, what fashion they belong to, and if there's any keywords. Keywords are important, we'll be getting to those in a moment. Underneath that on the left are your character's attributes and skills. On the right there's a wrath section, an objective section, and a survival section. And on the bottom is all your character's war gear. On the second page, on the top, is your list of talents and attributes. Talents and attributes are collected along the way during character creation. You'll be purchasing talents with XP and abilities you'll get from either your species or your archetype. Below the talents are your injuries and corruption. There's nothing that you actually need to fill out in the beginning unless you take something special or you start off as a chaos character. Below the injuries and corruption is the psychic power section. Uh, any psychic powers your character collects along the way will be uh, recorded there. Below that on the left is the, your notes section, which is fantastic for any player and for your GM as well. And then there's the Stealth and Passive Awareness sections right next to that, along with the XP earned and the XP collected. So what do you need to do character creation with? Well, you're going to need, of course, Pencil and your character sheet and some D6s. You can get the character sheet from the Cubicle 7 website. So first we're going to do a broad overview of what the character creation process is. First, you have your framework. Then you'll have choose your character's species, then their faction, and lastly their archetype. Archetype is also their class. So to start off your character, you're going to need to know what the framework is for your character. The framework is decided either by your GM or your party before you actually get together and make your characters. Framework is comprised of two major key components, and that is tier and keywords. So tier is your power level of your characters that you're playing. Uh, there are four tiers, with tier four being the most powerful and tier one being the least. Tier one has your characters such as your normal scum characters, which are the lowest of the criminal world, or your imperial guardsmen, which is your, just your run-of-the-mill soldier in this universe while Tier 4 will have things such as a Primaris Space Marine or an Inquisitor. 
So what mechanically does tier actually mean? Well, tier means how much experience points you'll get to start off the game. A tier 1 character will only start off with 1 to 100 experience points. Tier 2 will only start off with 200. Tier 3, 300. 4, 400. As you go along creating your character, you'll be spending experience. The next aspect of framework is knowing what keywords and factions are in play. The GM or the party may restrict what keywords or factions that they're going to be playing with. So what are keywords exactly? Well, keywords are a mechanic that allow characters to kind of interact or not interact with people, environments, things, and etc. So for an example, a Eldar character will have the uh, Eldari keyword, and that means they will actually have a bonus with using or acquiring Eldar equipment. But however, they may have a penalty to interacting with people that are part of the Imperium. In addition to having keywords restricted, some factions might be restricted as well. So for example, if you're playing a tier 3 campaign, the GM or party may restrict using Adeptus Astartes characters and use those as NPCs only. Now, as an example of framework, Cubicle 7 released a free adventure called the Graveyard Shift. So the Graveyard Shift has this restriction. Tier 1 or 2 characters with only the Imperium keyword. So mechanically that means only characters that are part of the Imperium. No Orc characters and no Eldar characters were allowed in this adventure. So we're going to be creating an example along the way. We're going to be doing a Tier 3 campaign with the Imperium and Adeptus Astartes keywords. We're now going to do our first step in actually creating your character, and that is choosing your character's species. There are currently, in the game, only five choices, and that is Human, Adeptus Astartes, Primaris Adeptus Astartes, Eldari, and Orc. Each one of these has an experience cost except for humans. However, you don't actually calculate this cost yet. We'll do that in the archetype step. Humans are the only ones that don't have any particular bonuses or penalties for choosing them. That's why they're free. All the other character options are they get uh, attribute bonuses, skill bonuses, speed variations, and then species abilities. However, the more powerful species selection is, the more expensive they are. So for our example, we're going to be choosing Adeptus Astartes as our species, and we're going to be naming him Titus Valifar. The next step is choosing your faction. So the factions are on page 42, and you're going to want to go there in the rulebook you'll see a list, master list of all the factions you can choose and you'll see that there's quite a large list. However, only humans can access the majority of this list. Orcs are tied, usually tied to the Orcs faction and Eldar to the Eldar faction. Anyway, when you go into the, each faction, you can choose actually a sub-faction. Faction will call it their own thing. For example, the Space Marines will be chapters, Eldar will be craft worlds, and if you choose the Astra Militarum, it would be your Imperial Guard Regiment. So, for example, you can actually choose to either be Cadian or like the Death Corps Creed if you character is an Astra Militarum character. All of these sub factions are actually optional, you don't need to choose one. However, it can give you some good bonuses. But on the flip side, it can actually give you some penalties as well. Once you've chosen your character's faction, you'll then go to that faction's pages in the rulebook. Inside those pages, you'll actually see a table for backgrounds. These are origin, accomplishment, and goal. Now, you can choose any of these options, or you can roll for them. 
To roll for them, it'll be called the D3 roll. So you'll need to get one D6 and roll for each one. Uh, one and two is one, three and four is two, and then five and six would be a result of a three. Origin is about where your character came from. Accomplishment is what have they done before you've taken over the character. And lastly is the goal. What does the character want to accomplish? Next, you'll also see that there is an objective table, and usually that one's a d6. You can go ahead and roll for that for your character as well, but keep in mind you will actually roll for that every session. So what objectives do is that they give your character a roleplay purpose for that session. And that could be anything from shouting your chapter's motto, or uh, screaming for the emperor, or praising the emperor, or whatever. It just gives you a roleplay purpose and then you can get some sort of reward for accomplishing that goal by the GM. So now we're going to get to the meat and potatoes of creating your character. And that will be choosing your character's archetype. Now if you've played other systems, archetypes are your character's class. So when you're in the archetype section of the rulebook, you will see a master list. All the archetypes are listed by tier type, and it, the easiest way to do this for now would just be to choose a character archetype within your tier. There's an advanced method called Ascension, which I'll cover in another video, that will allow you to use a lower level tier character in your current tier. So once you've chosen an archetype, you'll go to that archetypes page. On that page on the bottom, there's usually a table. That table will provide you a lot of the information that you'll need. For example, the archetype cost. Once you've chosen an archetype, you'll go to that archetypes page. On that page, you will see a table on the bottom. Uh, this table will have all the information you'll need to get the majority of your character created. So on this table, you'll see a, a lot of information that you'll need. So first, you'll see that there is any keywords this archetype provides. So you'll write that down on your character sheet. Second, you'll see the XP cost. Now you'll remember from me saying that we don't calculate the XP cost from your species until the archetype step. This is where you'll do it. The archetype cost is both your species cost and the cost of the archetype put together. If you did it separately, you might actually will go over the XP limit provided from your tier. For example, Adeptus the Star Days, if you paid for it, set the XP separately for both the species and your archetype, you'll go over the 300 XP that is provided at the beginning. So be sure to not subtract the XP from your species. Only do it from the archetype cost. So on this, also on this table, you'll see your starting attributes, skills, and an ability. So go ahead and just fill in your starting attributes and skills on the character sheet. Once you're done, be sure to put in your archetype ability in your talents and abilities page. And just as a reminder, if you haven't done it yet, make sure to put your species abilities in as well. Archetype abilities are only ever tied to that archetype. Each archetype has one, and no other archetype can actually get that ability. So from here, you're going to fill out all your war gear. In addition to all the war gear that your archetype provides, you will actually get a set of common clothing and three ammo. Ammo is kind of like the mana for your uh, ranged weapons. It's an important resource because you can actually run out of ammo in this game. Now, once you finish filling out your war gear, you'll see that you'll have an influence rating as well. What I recommend is just to write that influence level bonus next to your uh, influence section on your character sheet and just write whatever the bonus is. So once you have all your war gear written down and your influence bonus written down, we're now going to get to the fun part of your character creation and that is spending your leftover experience points. So once you've taken the XP off of your archetype cost, you'll have a leftover XP amount. You can now spend that on attributes, skills, and talents. So on your archetype, there is a 
suggested skills and a suggested attributes section with the XP costs. Now this will only help you create one specific type of character, but it can be a useful launch pad on creating your character as well. So to spend all your remaining XP, there are two pages that you'll want to know. The first one is page 24. That is the list of costs for both your attributes, and then on the next page after that is the same for skills. You'll notice that the table is in two sections. One is the per level cost or per rank cost, and then the other one is the uh, total cost. So if you went from zero to three for, let's say, agility, it will have the uh, your cost listed there. Or if you wanted just to jump from level two to three, and let's say willpower, and then it will have a smaller cost from jumping from level to level. Talents are on page 128. Um, they work is the same way. You, they have each one has an XP cost. Some of them have prereqs. For example, uh, a melee based one might have a prereq of weapon ratings four. So let's jump into the example. So Titus Malafar, after spending all, all the XP for both his species and at archetypes, will have 90 experience points left. So let's take a look at his character sheet. This is what your character sheet should look like so far. All the starting stats and equipment are recorded. Now I want to point out two things. One, for determination and influence, you'll see the plus and the number. These aren't finalized yet, so these are all the bonuses I've collected along the way. Second, under talents and abilities, you'll see Grim Resolve and The Unforgiven. These were from Titus's sub-faction, The Dark Angels Chapter. With that out of the way, I have 90 experience points to spend, so I'm going to first look at the talents. I want to make Titus a melee based character, so I think the talent Armor Bane would help. There's a prerequisite of two weapon skill, which we already have, so this talent will cost 20 XP. For another talent, Counter looks good. I'll need five weapon skill to use it, and it costs 30 XP, so I'll record that as well. I have 40 XP left, so I'll use the rest on skills and attributes. I have the prerequisite of a weapon skill rating of 5, so I'll fill in that first. To go from a rating of 3 to 5, that will cost me 18 XP. I'll also give Titus a 2 in leadership, so that will cost me 6 XP. Finally, I'll increase Titus's initiative. His weapon skill is tied to initiative, so that will help with him in his melee combat. I'll spend 15 XP to do that. Once you have everything spent, it's time to fill in the totals. You can see that S, or Strength, has a bonus. This is from Titus's armor. It gives him a bonus of 3 in Strength. So we'll add the 4 and the 3 for a Strength total of 7. T, or Toughness, is 4 with no bonuses. That will then be a straight total of 4. Repeat this for the rest of the attributes. Agility, Initiative, Willpower, Intelligence, and Fellowship. If you have a blank space for an attribute, then the rating will be 1. Next, we'll do the skill totals. From here, you'll just take the attribute total and add it with the skill rating. Athletics uses Strength, so the Athletics total will be 10 since the rating was 3 and the attribute total was 7. This total is the amount of dice you roll for using that skill. Titus would roll 10 dice in Athletics to do an Athletics skill test. Fill in the rest of the skills, however, keep in mind that unless you have the Psych or Keyword, your Psychic Mastery will be zero. I would like to thank King Kang 27 on Reddit for actually making this form fillable character sheet available. I will post a link of this form fillable character sheet in the description. Now, once you've purchased all your attributes, skills, and talents, there's actually one more thing you can spend your XP on. You can actually buy a language for one experience point. There's a list of languages towards the beginning of the um, book on, in the species section. Take a look at that. There's not a whole lot of languages in this game as compared to other systems, but it can still be useful for, let's say, you're human and you can understand uh, the Eldari language. So now we're going to start finalizing all the mechanical details of your character. So first is the rank. Rank is on the top of your character sheet, and you can just put a 1 in there. Ranks are kind of like levels, 
it goes from one to three. Ranks are t can be tied with both role playing purposes and with uh, actual uh, mechanical aspects as well. Several abilities and talents are tied to your character's rank, such as doing more damage based on your rank. So, we're going to get into the nitty gritty details of your character right now. We're going to start off by doing some of the combat traits. The first combat trait is defense. Defense is initiative minus one. So what does defense actually do? The defense is how many successes your enemy needs to roll to hit your character. So if you have an initiative of three, your defense will be two. That means when an char enemy character attacks, they have to roll two successes to hit your character. And that brings us to the next um, part of your character. And that is the base resilience. So base resilience is toughness plus one. Base resilience is how much damage your character can naturally ignore. You would actually add this to your armor rating and that will give you your total resilience. So if you have a resilience of three, an armor of two, you can ignore up to five damage. The next combat trait is called wounds. Uh, also you can call them health, health points, but since it's Warhammer 40k based, this is it's going to be called wounds. Wounds aren't measured from top to bottom, they're actually measured in how many wounds your character has received. So you all characters start off with zero wounds and they go up to their max. So if you have a tier 2 character and you have a toughness of 2, you will have 4 wounds. Next is going to be shock. Shock is willpower plus your character's tier. I'm not going to go into too much detail on shock, we'll be going over that in a rules and combat rules video. But just to give you an idea, it is how much damage your character can mentally just ignore, mentally just shake off. That is how much of that damage that your character can mentally shake off is determined by determination. Determination is just a straight toughness roll. As I said, I'll go more into that in a combat roll section, but just so you know how it is, roughly how it is, determination is how much dice you have to roll. So now we're going to get into the mental traits. The first mental trait is corruption. Normally, all characters start with zero corruption. However, if you choose a chaos character or certain talents or traits that you choose might actually increase your corruption rating. Corruption is resisted by the, the trait conviction. Conviction is just your straight willpower. Next is resolve. Resolve is your willpower minus one. Resolve is used for resisting fear tests or other mental conditions. The last mental trait is your passive awareness. Your passive awareness is just your awareness total halved. And if it's in between, you round up. And last but not least, it's your social traits. So influence is your fellowship minus one. So what that means is that if you only had one fellowship to begin with, you can start with an influence of zero. However, you might have gotten some influence bonuses along the way with either your archetype or with your character's background results. Just add all those up together and that will give you your final result for your character's influence. Now influence is used for, mechanically actually it's used for acquiring more war gear and more items for your character. And that brings us into the next social um, trait and that is wealth. Wealth is just your tier. If you start off at tier 2, you get 2 wealth. If you start off at tier 1, you get 1 wealth. And that's everything that you pretty much need mechanically for your character. Your character is actually done. Uh, most of this next section is entirely optional, but it can help bring your character to life. There are quite a few tables in the beginning of the rule book that actually give a bunch of appearances for you randomly, depending on your character's uh, species. On page 34, there is a whole section called Bringing Your Character to Life. It asks you, the player, a bunch of questions about your character. You can go through those if you want. They provide a good tool, even if you're an advanced player of role-playing games, or if you're a beginner. If you're a beginner, it gives you a lot of good things to think about for your character. In addition, there are also a lot of tables that deal with your character's appearances. You can randomly roll on them, 
or you can just choose one from the list or just make up something else entirely. And that can include age, eyes, hair, height, and any features your character starts off with. And then lastly, on page 247, there are a trio of tables. These are the trinket tables. Trinkets are not quite gear. They are actually more for role-playing purposes. Uh, sometimes I've played it where a trinket has given me a plot hook for uh, actually the main plot. Other times it's just something completely random that your character just happens to have. Um, it can be anything from a prayer book to uh, owning a piece of bone from a saint. Or it could be having a key ring that you know goes to a bunch of stasis chambers all across the uh, sector that you're in. Trinkets are entirely optional in my opinion. I have played multiple games of Wrath and Glory where the trinket either just didn't make sense for the character or did, didn't make sense for that campaign or the, the player made the character and then just completely ignored the trinket. If your character wants the trinket and it's a fun roll and sometimes you get a good laugh at what you get, go for it and do it. But you don't actually need the trinket. It can provide you some good plot hooks, it can provide you with some role play. In addition, you can also make up your own uh, trinket if you want. For example, prayer beads and your character actually uses the prayer beads during um, role play that actually might be a good trinket but having an orc holding on to a copy of the uplifting infantry man's primer doesn't make as much sense so that's how you create your character in wrath and glory i hope you've enjoyed this video i'll be making several more videos on wrath and glory on how the game plays some advanced character options how to do leveling up and on how to set up an investigative uh campaign for GMs. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please make sure to like and subscribe and share it with your friends. Have a good one.